How are you guys doing? Welcome over here to the channel. If you guys are new, hey, this is not my normal setup. I'm, I'm actually traveling right now. I'll be back home tomorrow, so you guys will see the normal setup tomorrow. We do two videos every single day over the Ukrainian conflict because it's ever changing. The thing is constantly changing on the ground. This is war over there, so it is changing, and we are trying to keep you guys as updated as possible. So I did bring this on the road. So this backdrop you guys are currently seeing, I am I'm not in the same state I was yesterday. I'm in a different hotel room, so I know it looks kind of it looks kind of mediocre. But with that being said, please do me a favor, subscribe if you guys are new, so you guys can keep up to date on everything that is going on over there I, I literally do a ton of map annotations that's what i'm about to go over with you guys real quick here out the gate so like i said subscribe so you guys do not miss out on anything that's going up so here is the north northeast area of ukraine you guys can i just wanted you guys to take a little gander of uh, where we were sitting at yesterday a little understanding so we're going to move over to the new map here so this is the northeast region just just outside of kiev as you guys can see i have not annotated anything on this thing for you guys uh Cherty Kiev up here and you guys see um this area has been held off the entire time i've said this multiple times they've not been able to push through that is the russian forces they have actually started to make another push from the western side of Chernikiv. they've started making that that push in they've been trying to uh, over the last 24 it's actually been more like the last 12-ish hours they've been trying to push in on an assault element they have not been able to get through so they just continue to shell it you guys see here in the north or excuse me the northeast region they have started to push through they've lost uh, the russian forces actually have lost a little bit of ground in between their elements so they actually do have a split element right here this element has been split off from the main force, which is just east of it. So that is a good thing for the Ukrainians. They've actually been able to push push past them and actually break that element up. But as you guys can tell, the Russian forces are actually trying to push back through there to regain that ground. Since we're sitting up here and you guys may be new to the channel, I'll go ahead and annotate on the map for you guys the exact areas where Ukrainian forces have fortified their positions pretty heavily. Now, the eastern and western side of Kiev have been pretty much fortified and actually getting into Kiev right now. It's actually extremely hard to get in for the, the Russian forces. They've stacked the entire roads going in with just jacked up vehicles. Over the last week of fighting, they've literally just taken them and piled them into the roads so Russians can't actually bring their tanks and stuff into the city once they get in. Now up here in the northeast, Chernikiv was and is still pretty much fended pretty heavily. Uh, Konotop has not been taken yet by the Russians. Sumy is still under Russia, or excuse me, Ukrainian control. The Russians have actually put out that they surround the city completely, but that is not verified as of yet. Kharkiv is completely um, surrounded by Ukrainian forces still. On the southern, uh, the, I guess it would be more like the southeastern and southwestern side is completely uh, held off by Ukrainian forces. The north side of that, where they came in from Belgorod, as you guys do know, which I will annotate for everybody who is new, which is just north of here. This area right here that I just put a square and an X in, that is one of the areas that Russians actually staged to push their forces south. And that's one of the areas they continue to stage their APCs and tanks to move in. Over here along the east side, we do know, I did I did talk about this yesterday. They did move out of this town that is the Russians. They did move out of ba Balaklia and they have pushed down into Izium. There's been a, a a tick is what I would normally call it. That's what we call it in Afghanistan and in Iraq. It's, it's troops in contact. They've been in, they've been in a firefight there for the last 12-ish hours. Uh, it's been pretty heavy fighting from what I've from what I've found. I haven't been able to experience it because I'm clearly not there, but that's that's what's been going on, and we've spoke about this a few separate times. If they push through, that will give the Russians the advantage to the north as they will actually end up squeezing the Ukrainians down here in these major cities of Slovenansk and Sierinovinitsk. If you guys are new, you're going to hear me jack up some names, which is not a big deal. Down here in Mariupol, some stuff has been going on, but they're still completely surrounded down there. Um, Tokmak. This map is not annotated correctly. I'm going to tell you guys right now it is not. These areas over here have not been taken by Russian forces. Okay. Those are still held off by Ukraines. Tokmak is still Ukrainian held. Orkiv, still Ukrainian held. Yorkiv has actually pushed some of its forces down into Tokmak to actually help reinforce that area still. This whole area that you guys are seeing from the south to southwestern side is pretty accurate. Uh, Kyrgyzstan, there's been a lot of protests going on there. Mykolaiv is still held off by Ukrainian forces pretty heavily on either side. They haven't pushed through any of the waterways. They've tried one time and it did not pan out too well. And Russian forces are up here pushing back north into this this uh, town of Voznesik. Uh, we do know that they, they did get ambushed yesterday. We showed footage to you guys of that. So I don't know how much farther south they've pushed yet. Right now, I know that the furthest element over there has actually been kind of broken up and no one really knows where it's at. So I, I do believe that ambush that actually hit them that we showed you guys yesterday did put a pretty decent dent in the Ru Russians' ability to actually move onto Odessa. 
So I'm actually going to tell you guys a little bit about this Russian convoy. So I know this is one of the things that people have been talking about. We're going up here north again. We're going north of Kiev up to Chernobyl area. And this one, I've seen that it's 40 miles long. I've seen that it's 17 miles long. I don't exactly know. And I don't know if anybody really knows. We're going to say it's between 17 and 40 miles long, which is either way you look at it, it is extremely long. I have found out some good stuff for you guys as to why this thing has not pushed forward. I, I, I've been saying it's because of logistics, which it is. A lot of it has to do with logistical issues, fuel, water, food, all that kind of stuff. And which is even kind of crazy. The longer they sit there, the more of a sitting duck they are. And this has actually been coming out that the, the front vehicles of this convoy have actually been struck. A lot of people have been saying, why haven't the Ukrainians been striking the entire convoy? Well, they have. They've been striking the first few vehicles and they've actually made them inoperable and they've kind of like blocked the front with their own vehicles. Somewhat ironic, but they have. So let's actually go over to Google Earth real quick. I'm going to show you guys. Uh, I do have the grid coordinates to some bridges that have been causing a little bit more issues as well for these that, that 17 to 40 mile long convoy. Why they haven't been able to push forward. So there is one of the bridges that have actually been blown out is the one that is between, it's just around, excuse me, it's just on the eastern side of Ivankiv on the Tetrachev River. And it's right here. As I could, I could show you guys, this bridge right here has actually been blown out. And it's one of the reasons why they haven't been able to push through. I'm going to go back over here to the map so you guys can see the road that I'm talking about. So that road or that bridge right there that is leaving, leading into the northwestern side of Kiev is also been blown out. I have a couple more I'm going to show you guys. These are kind of, these are pretty fairly important to know. I'm going to go over here actually and show you guys exactly on this map. I'm going to go ahead. I'm just going to kind of put the general area so you guys can see. I'm going to put it with an X on this map right here. So that is the general area of where that bridge that I just showed you was blown out. So I'm going to go back over here to Google real quick. And this would be another area. You guys see this route P56 right here. This other bridge right here is the is another reason why they can't actually move. This is the Cameron Slavovich checkpoint bridge. So that one right there also has been blown out. I wonder if I can show you guys on them. Yeah, here's the here's the Google Earth image of it. That bridge right there has actually been taken out, which has actually impeded them from actually moving down as well or moving around. Like that's one of the other reasons why they're kind of blocked off, if you could tell. So one of the other ones, there's actually two more, is the the one that's uh, the E40 route coming out of Kiev into Z Zimitar, that highway bridge. I'll show you guys that as well. Here is another bridge for you guys. So that, I told you the E40 route. It is roughly here it is it's right here so you guys see this it's right over the Tetrachev river again so if we zoom out so you guys can see it's the main route it's coming from out just outside of zimitar and on the the western way western side of kiev is is that same route so it's on this main route which is it's going to be roughly i'm going to put an x for you guys it's going to be roughly somewhere about right here ish okay and the final one is just outside of urban and i'm going to give you guys the exact location of that one as well and here is the final one. See, this is Route E373, the Irpin River. And this is going to be on the northwest side once again of Kiev. As you guys can tell, it's one of the main routes that's coming in to the northwest side. That bridge right there that you are seeing, and I'll flip over to Google Earth, that one right there is also blown out. So there's actually been a temporary ceasefire that has been declared on Maripol, uh, between Maripol and Volkanova between 9 a.m. and 4 p.m. as of today. A humanitarian route has actually been set up to evacuate uh, civilian population, which I'll actually annotate the route that they're actually taking or going to be taking here on the map, or they should be taking. So coming out of Maripol, they're coming north and going this way through here. And they're going to Zaps or Zia. So that's the exact route they've been taking. And if you guys don't know, Volokanova is right here. So there's been a ceasefire there. And also on Maripol, they've been, they both have, have been under heavy, heavy shelling. Volokanova is pretty much destroyed at this point from what I could find. And what I mean by destroyed, like, like literally sent to dust. And it's almost completely controlled by Russian forces. Anybody that's in there is pretty much after this, this point, if these civilians do get out, is going to be known as an enemy combatant. That's one of the reasons why they're okay with letting them go. But there's also been reports, though, from the mayor, uh, Maripol's dep deputy mayor, Sergei Orlov that has stated that Russians have actually continued to bomb us in the artillery despite the ceasefire. That's coming directly from the mayor down there. Uh, I don't know how true that is or not, but I'm, I'm just telling you guys what it is. Russian losses as of March 5th all right, so a lot of people don't believe some of these things that they do here. And I'm going to tell you guys to take them with a grain of salt at, at certain times. But I think these, and the reason why I say that is because it is coming out of a Ukrainian um, newspaper, but I, I don't think they're too far off. And the reason why I say this is they're 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 advancing on defensively held positions. And a lot of people don't realize this. I've said this multiple times. When you run at a trench system, someone that's been dug in for the last seven years, you're going to have a very high casualty rate. Very high. You're going to take significant losses. Russia 
Russians knew this going in there. Like they knew they, they I don't think they knew that they're going to take abstain the, the, these kind of these kind of losses, but they are taking some. They've taken just at over 10,000 troops have been killed and or wounded so far. 39 planes have been taken down, 40 helicopters, 269 tanks. 269 tanks is what happens, I guess, when you roll in with Soviet era tanks. 105 artillery pieces, 945 armored personnel carriers, 50 MLRSs, two boats, 409 cars, 60 fuel tanks, three UAVs, and 18 aircraft warfare. So there hasn't been much change on the boat situation and the eight uh, aircraft carriers, but in the fuel trucks pretty much the same. But everything else, they've taken some hits. I will say over the last couple days, it has slowed down just a tad. And I think that has a lot to do with the fact that Russians are having to literally regroup and reorganize themselves because they got their teeth kicked in and they weren't expecting this kind of resistance going in to Ukraine. And I think I've said that since the very beginning. The Ukrainians, a lot of people don't realize these kind of losses can be, and you got to think about it. They've been trained. The Ukrainian military has been trained for the last seven-ish years by NATO forces. United States special operators have been in there like working with these people directly, telling them how to set up, how to fortify the positions, how to sell, set up ambushes, ambushes, how to use the equipment. Like I think a lot of these Russian forces have came in here not properly prepared, not trained well enough. They thought they were like, I don't know, going to come in and just kick the teeth in of these Ukrainians and they didn't fight us. I, I don't think they came in with the right mindset of like, we're going to take over this country. And now they're spread themselves so thin. And I'm not the only person saying this. You can ask all these people that are like way better than me and analyzing stuff militarily. They've spread themselves so thin between the north, uh, east and southern regions of Ukraine. This country is not small. And the way that they're spread out so much right now, there's no way that I don't think they're going to be able to make any major pushes. They really need to get a control of one area and then push through. Now, the northern end having all those logistics stuck in that one area is really screwing them a little bit. They've, they've now started pushing stuff 5,500 miles away from the, the most eastern coast of Russia, like over by Japan and Alaska type stuff. They're pushing that force over here to Ukraine. And if they, if, if they knew that this was going to be that kind of a battle, they would have moved this stuff a week ago, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. But that's why I'm, that's why I'm telling you guys, they came in here ill-prepared, not really thinking the Ukrainian forces were going to do the things they do. And now they're having to call in reinforcements. From what I've read, there's also been uh, just over 65,000 men who have actually returned to Ukraine from abroad since the war has broke out to help fight the Russian invasion. The defense minister himself of Ukraine has stated that the number of represented uh, is the amount of men that has actually returned home so far to take up arms to protect the country from Russian forces. There's been heavy, heavy, heavy fighting along the leading route that comes in. That same one we actually just showed you where all those, those roads are blown out. I can actually show you this main round right here. I'm going to circle it. That main route right there, that one that's in black, Go ahead. You know what? I'll just go ahead and draw draw it out for you guys. So that main route that comes in from the western side of Kiev from Zimitar, that main route has experienced heavy, 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 heavy fighting, which has led to Russian abandoning T-72B3 on the main highway and also a BMP-2. And I have some uh, some images and videos of that right now for you guys. You saw Пидорасиков, блядь, буду до кипа, нахуй, да? Рабочая титра... The Ukrainian military has actually shot down another Russian jet along with capturing its pilots just outside of Chernigiv, which is, of course, just northeast of Kiev. I have video proof of the jets going down. Show it there. <laughs> With the pilots actually ejecting. Peace time. And there's some photos of the crash site of where they've landed and they've actually been captured. I'm not going to show the video or footage of the, the actual Russian soldier captured because it'll be flagged here on YouTube. Um, he just was banged up a little bit is all, but they captured him alive. So they do have that, which is always a big deal to capture a, a Russian uh, somebody. I mean, you got to think about it. The people that are fighting these jets are fairly high up in the ranks. So, so that is that is kind of a big deal for Ukrainian military. So in the Buka district, I can show you guys exactly where that's at. I'm going to say it is right here. You guys see Buka. It is on the northwestern side just south of Hostomol. So this area right here, you guys see Buka. So there's Buka right there. I'm going to go ahead and zoom out so it's not as bad. So Buka is right here. So that is going to be the area we're talking about right now. In the Buka's district, a, a uh, Russian force has actually opened fire on a car filled with civilians. Two people were killed, including a 17-year-old girl, and four people were, were injured. So here is another town. So you guys see Bela... Terzirka? Terzirka? Anyway, that is the most southern area I've actually seen this this kind of heavy, heavy shelling. Um, here is some video proof of the aftermath of that. Sure, 
Мучили приватний сектор. Зараз шукаємо людей. Будьте обережні, слухайте сигнал тривоги. Now, to me, that is kind of nuts. So if they're sitting here putting a bunch of shelling on this town right here, if you guys can see. So that main one that is right there is just southwest of Kiev. I, I don't know if they're... they're I, to me, that is kind of crazy because I haven't seen any type of fighting in that, that area whatsoever. As you guys can see, there's been nothing really at all in this entire main southern region of Kiev. I wonder if they're doing that, the Russians, that is, if they're doing that right now as like a preemptive strike to come in and actually do something to push through that southern side of Kiev. Or are they, they, they doing this to do an airborne drop on that backside, which I did tell you guys about a week ago. The Belarusian army was preparing for an airborne assault on, on a town that was un, undisclosed. That this, this was actually one of the areas. Areas, I was thinking like that southern side of Kiev is one of those areas that there somebody's going to have to push through. I don't think it's going to be the Belarusian military, but it, I, I do believe that the Russian, if they were going to do some type of airborne assault, it's going to be down inside of this area that's not really had any action. And that could be one of the things they're doing is shelling the city to like a preemptive type thing for their men to actually jump. And as I'm scrolling through here, the evacuations of the cities out, uh, the civilians out of Maripool apparently is now po postponed. So it is actually now come out that Russians are not allowing the ceasefire to happen, which is down here. The one that I did show you guys earlier, that route that is coming out, this one right here, that one right there, that is the one that the civilians were supposed to be taking out, but apparently it's not going to be, hap it's not happening now. The Russians have not stopped the shelling, even though there's supposed to be a ceasefire that's going on, which shouldn't shock too many people with the last with the last 48 hours we've seen them do some really really crazy stuff it was it, what's even nuts to me is a lot of people think that i'm like pro ukraine or pro just west i'm just trying to be as, as unbiased as i possibly can and when a country like russia decides to drop mortars and shoot artillery rounds and tank rounds at a at a at a nuclear facility i'm gonna it's gonna be it's kind of strange like i get I, it's war i get it but a lot of people say that there's no laws and that there really are i mean when i was in afghanistan Iraq, we follow the rules there's rules you have to follow that one was a little out. So there's actually been major protests down here in Kirsten. So I'm going to show you guys where Kirsten is at. As you guys do know, I have told you guys before, Kirsten, there was there was pretty heavy fighting for the first three or four days. But then Ukrainian forces actually decided, which I believe was pretty smart. Uh, I, I've looked at the lay of the land a little bit, and I believe it's really flat there. But Kirsten, they moved back up into Mykolaiv. They went northwest that way. So they actually the, the troops actually did pull back. But this town right here, they've been having heavy, heavy, heavy <laughs> civilians have been going down there and protesting pretty significantly. And I'm going to show you guys the video of that right now. <laughs> this civilian is kind of nuts. Decided to jump on top of a Russian BTR with a with a Ukrainian flag. I mean, just just said, you know what, screw it. I would assume he either got arrested. I, I don't think they would have shot him in plain sight, but I would assume he's getting arrested because what's going on in Russia right now? They're arresting everybody for protesting just in just even a little bit. Uh, the SBU there in Ukraine has actually just killed a member of the Ukrainian negotiations team, which is kind of nuts. This is some stuff you'd think you'd see on a TV show. But it's not. Apparently, he's been suspected of treason. The man was apparently killed during an arrest attempt to doing a, uh, due to strong evidence that he was leaking information to the Russian government. What? That's crazy. So the guy that's literally on the Ukrainian-Russian negotiation teams for Ukraine was just killed by the SBU because he was leaking information to the Russian. Like, that is... What in the world? Oh my God. And it actually looks like martial law may be a thing that is coming for the Russian citizens. Oh man, we're going back to the Iron Curtain type days. So we're, I, that to me, that is, that's crazy. It shouldn't too too shocking for a lot of people though. I, I did I did read through some articles that I'm going to share with you guys this morning. If you guys don't know what martial law is real quick, martial law is when a military rule temporarily substitutes civilian rule invoked usually during a time of war. President Zelensky, as we all know, did declare martial law inside of Ukraine. This was as of last week, and it bars every Ukrainian man from 18 to 60 from leaving the country. Basically, it bars everybody that's between military age uh, of fighting to, to, from leaving. So under martial law, the military steps in place of civilian institutions like the police. So what happens if, if Putin declares it? So the Russian constitution actually gives Putin the power to declare martial law in case of an aggression against the Russian Federation or the direct threat of aggression. Martial law could give the Kremlin near absolute power to escalate with impunity. It's already punishing crackdowns on anti war descendants in the country. As we do know, they've actually arrested around 10,000 people. Thousands have already been arrested for engaging in anti-war protests. And this week, the Russian legislator mulled. So they're, they're thinking about doing a new law that would hand a 15-year jail sentence for people who spread false news about the war. Thank God I'm not in Russia, because apparently what I'm doing currently, speaking the, tr the truth about what is really going on, would be considered uh, propaganda in, in, 
and I would get a 15 year jail sentence in Russia, which to me is just nuts. That's the world we live in. I feel, I feel bad for everybody over there because now they're not going to allow them to leave the country. And they're thinking that it could be implemented as of a late, like late, later today, matter of fact. By the way, Russia's Aeroflot, that's, that's that airline over there, halts all international flights starting March 8th. So that came in just a few minutes ago when I was over there actually getting prepped and ready for this. So as of March 8th, you cannot fly out of the country using that airlines. There are no more international flights. Russian government has also been creating fake reality over there in Russia. So it's basically like another version of North Korea. Country's economy is expected to shrink by 20% in the second quarter and by around 3.5% for the full year following the intensified sanctions. That's pretty nuts. That's, 25, that's almost 25%. So the same day uh, that they that they're thinking about it, publishing this 15-year law, the uh, Russia's telecommunication regulators started blocking Facebook due to its decision to fact-check pro-Kremlin media and mark them as untrustworthy. <laughs> Oh God. So you're not allowed to use Facebook because Facebook is fact checking and the Kremlin's like, you know what? You can't fact check us. You cannot fact check us. <laughs> Putin's regime needs to destroy all independent media to prevent them from covering Russia's aggression against Ukraine. What's happening in Ukraine is so outrageous that Russia will create a completely fake reality. When Russian troops withdraw, they will report the opposite. The Kiev and Kar Kharkiv have actually been seized by Russia. That's nuts. Experts agree that Russia will likely turn into a North Korea light, a semi totalitarian fully totalitarian state. Speculations rife that Russia may also announce mass mobilization to boost its war effort in place of its economy entirely on war. That's crazy. So now they're, gonna, they're literally going to change the economy of the country to benefit the war. There's a high probability that Russia will turn into a giant military camp like North Korea and yet more advanced. Russia's economy may survive similarly to those of Iran and North Korea. They don't need a market economy. They need an economy that will be a gigantic military factory. And their economy would become more of a... Uh, a status of private businesses being destroyed by sanctions and ec economic crisis that follows, as we do all know. And it will be more, I guess you would say, anything that is, is it's kind of like China and everywhere else, I guess you would say, that's pretty much outside of the free world. If, if, it, if it's state-owned and state-ran and it's for the state, then it's going to be prosperous. If it's not, go ahead and go to the wayside. So there's that piece. And one of the last ones we're going to talk about is the fact, and I will see you guys here, uh, you know what, I will see you pro probably next 12 hours. See you guys.